Welcome to the teaching by Redwood Church of God Ministries, Shemot, or what is now known in English as Exodus, coming from the Latin. Um, the Catholic Church changed it from Shemot, which is names, because Shem means name, to plural, because that's what the start of the chapter was. They changed it to Exodus to refer to the Exodus from Egypt. This story um, and some of the highlights in it are by Adela, a parashat, as well as teachings uh, from other leaders over the years, um, such as Rabbi Chester Stanley, um, and many others. So some of the information is what other commentators have said before, and we're just highlighting certain things. Bereshit, or Genesis, is the account of individuals striving to live their lives in the presence of the Almighty Elohim and attempting to embrace his mission even during his times of silence. But in the book of Shemot, or Exodus, the individuals have become a people in a foreign land. We move through a couple hundred years of virtual silence regarding their time in Egypt. What little we know is covered in one verse of Shemot. 1-7 But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Joseph had purposely planted his father's family in the land of Goshen, where they had li could live a set-apart life, which means holy, from the Egyptians. It was a place where they could continue their lives as shepherds caring for their flocks. Does the above verse, however, imply that many of the Israelites had left Goshen and filled the land? Not all of the land of Egypt was conductive to raise sheep. Had many of the sons of Israel separated from their family and acquired other occupations that gained them wealth as defined by Egypt? Now, after hundreds of years and no direct word from uh, Yah, Elohim, the new king of Egypt finds himself threatened by the numerous and successful Israelites. The sages say that the work of the Egyptians imposed on them was veiled in national service, but it soon gave way to subjugation and eventually enslavement. Exodus 1.8 Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more mightier than we. Come, let us deal so shrewdly with them, at least they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our, our armed enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built the, for Pharaoh supply cities in Pithom and Ramses. Now who are the, uh, what was happening was that they, the Egyptians had just won their freedom not too long um, after being conquered by the Hyksos, who were of uh, Middle Egypt, um, and Lower Egypt, but mostly they were Greco-Egyptian um, historian. Manetho told us in the 3rd century that the Hyksos used to ethnically be designated people, a probable Western Semitic, Levantine origin. While Manetho portrays that the Hyksos are invaders and oppressors, this interpretation is questioned in modern Egyptology. Instead, Hyksos ruled mighty might have been preceded by groups of Canaanites, people who gradually settled in the Nile Delta from the end of the 12th dynasty onwards and who may have succeeded from the crumbling and unstable Egyptian control at some point during the 13th dynasty. The Hyksos period marked the first in which Egypt was ruled by foreign rulers. Many details of their rule, such as the true extent of their kingdom and even the names and order of their kings, remains uncertain. The Hyksos practice may have many Levitine or Canaanite customs, as well as many Egyptian customs. They have been credited with introducing several technology innovations to Egypt, such as the horse and chariot, as well as the sickle sword 
and the composite bow, compo composite bow, a theory which is in dispute. But the point is, the Hyksos did not control all of Egypt, instead they coexisted with the 16th and 17th dynasties, which were based in Thebes. Warfare between the Hyksos and the pharaohs at the late 17th dynasty eventually accumulated into the defeat of the Hyksos by Ahamos I, who founded the 18th dynasty of Egypt. In the following centuries, the Egyptians would portray the Hyksos as bloodthirsty and oppressive foreign rulers. So they won their freedom, and because they're Canaanite they're, and they're Semitic in nature, they feared that the Israelites would side with them because they're, they are ethnically similar. So the, 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 the rulers were shrewd, what any ruler would do to subjugate and make sure that they didn't uh, side with the enemy and conquer. But... Had they just remained uh, shepherds, would any of this have happened? But because they did not remain where they were told to, or follow the plan of Joseph, it was kind of a self-filled um, prophecy. Here's an example of uh, art in Egyptian that portrays a hyksos. All of this you can find uh, if you Google it um, on Wikipedia and other sources. According to the Sacred Bridge, a book by Rainey and Notley, the city of Ramses had temples to serve God, several gods, in particular Ra, sun god, and Seth, the god of the dust and the earth. Those who were once Israel shepherds were now in the business of building something dedicated to a sun god. After hundreds of years, no doubt the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the promises associated with them seemed far removed from the minds of their descendants. It's also interesting to know that Seth, we talked about last week, was the origin came from Baal, um, who we were talking about um, also during the time of Hanukkah would was the, um, the, uh, was also um, Zeus um, and set up in the temple an image of him. And Zeus is equated to Seth and the Egyptian gods. If you look at it, um, they have a list that compare all the um, kingdoms from Babel on up, even uh, uh, all the way back to Tammuz. And you can see that this is the um, this is a representation of the God that is opposed to the God of the Bible, to Yah. So it's not strange that, and, and it's not uh, it's not lost that they were building temples to gods and being subjugated by the enemy of God. From enslavement, we will quickly move to the first stage of liberation. The story of the redemption of the children of Israel begin with the birth of a baby. And you can see this as uh, an example of a shadow and a type of what Yeshua or Jesus will become. That there is uh, a type of, of Messiah that the Messiah duplicates Joseph as well as Moses. And you're seeing these portrayed. Moshe, who was Moses, was born in the family from the tribe of Levi. At that time, there was an edict by the king that all newborn baby boys were to be thrown into the Nile River. We know the story well of Moshe being placed in the basket or an ark. The same Hebrew word, what Noah's ark, is used here. The basket is an ark, where we found by the daughter of Pharaoh, adopted and named. Exodus 2.10 And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, the Hebrew, his mother, and he became her son to the daughter of Pharaoh. So she called his name Moshe, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. What was the significance of the name of the Pharaoh's daughter selected by, for the baby? It's possible that we can gain some insight by understanding more about Pharaoh and the Nile. Ezekiel 29.3 tells us, 
Because sometimes answers that you may have about what's going on in Scripture that is not answered may come up later as people um, expound upon what was mentioned. Ezekiel 23 is a good example. Speak and say, Thus says Adonai, Yah, Behold, I am against you, O Pharaoh king of Egypt, O great monster who lies in the midst of his rivers, who has said, My river is my own, and I have made it for myself. Pharaoh not only believed he was a god, but he also believed that he had created the Nile River. For himself, this is helpful in understanding why Pharaoh suggests that babies be thrown in the river. He was allowing the river to decide who would live and who would die. The Nile River made the judgment, and thus he was able to wash his hands of the baby's murders, which most politicians would come up with a solution and wash their hands of it. And this is a very good example of how it is. And yes, they didn't make the Nile, but they're taught as young that they're gods of this earth, so therefore they made the, the Nile. Pharaoh thought of himself as a god, which is why he named his daughter Pythia, which in Hebrew means daughter of God, or it's also Egyptian. First Chronicle 4.17 The sons of Ezra were Jethreth, Mered, Epher, and Yolan, because the J is a Y pronunciation. Emered's wife bore Miriam, Shemani, the Ishba, and father of Eshtemoa. His wife, Yehuhaya, bore Yered, the father of Gedor, the Heb Hebrer, the father of Sukkah, and Yekuthiel, the father of Zonah. And these were the sons of Bithia, the daughter of Pharaoh, who Mered took. A good example of what we were talking about when we were talking about Ephesians 2, the adoption process by which they lose the identity which they were. She lost her identity as a Gentile and became one with Israel. And she was accounted as such. That's how God sees Gentiles. They no longer are Gentiles, but they are part of the children of Israel. Therefore, he expects that you will abide by when you read the things that says this is for Israel. That is to you. It is not to just a person who is born in a Jewish line. It is by adoption that you are here. And as Christians, that is your place. All the promises are to Israel. If you're not a part of Israel, then you're fooling yourself. You cannot be a Gentile and stay a Gentile. It's about converting from Gentile to Israelite, the family of God, the upright ones. That's what Israel means. As I've stated before in the lessons, Bithia is the name of the woman who saved the name Moshe. Who, her father was the god of the Nile, and she was the daughter of God. The Netziv, the famous Russian Jew of 1800s, suggested that the name Moshe comes from the ancient Egyptian word for son. Exodus 2:10. And he became her son, so she called his name Moshe. And this is Moshe in Hebrew, saying, "Because I drew him out of the water." And this is the ter this is the Hebrew of that term, because I drew him out of the water. You can see Moshe is highlighted. Other ancient Egyptian language sources also confirm that Moshe means son, which is the definition in mine. It explains the reason why Bithya thinks the child is hers. She knew the child had Hebrew parents, but in a way she is claiming that the Nile gave birth to her son. The baby emerged from the Nile alive, which was significance for Bithya. He was therefore declared son of the Nile. You could also say it's a rebirth like baptism. By the name, she was obviously positioning him to become the next pharaoh, or at least to take his place among the pantheon of Egyptian gods. The future savior of Israel would be seen as an Egyptian god. Also, according to the reasoning, the word Meshiatu is not related to the name Moshe, but rather is the reason because I drew him out why she called him Moshe. This is a play on the words common to Hebrew. Acts 7 
gives us just a bit more information on Moshe's upbringing. Acts 7.22 And Moshe was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in the words and deeds. And that was the wisdom of the Egyptians. It would have been a very secular education, including instructions on the Egyptian gods like Oris, Hecta, Apis, and Ra. And remember, Moshe himself would have been uh, thought of as an Egyptian culture as one of these gods. Now, after all these years in Egypt, the Israelites would not have been ignorant of the god Moshe. Imagine their surprise when the god of Egypt turns out to be involved in the redemption of Israel. I hope that you are not missing the shadows of the Messiah Yeshua in the life of Moses. Moshe will become the critical link throughout the rest of the Torah, and the Torah, as I've said before, is from Genesis to Revelation. But it also has a term of the first five books, but I'm talking about all of Scripture. In the development of matur uh, maturation of the motley bunch of slaves who will become the chosen people, it will take 80 years, r let me say that again, 80 years from Moshe, to be re ready to play his role in their redemption. He will focus on four events in his life and are part of the mat maturing process, which we will discuss. Okay, first, Moshe kills the Egyptian who strikes the, e the Hebrew. Second, Moshe addresses the two fighting Hebrews. The third part is Pharaoh's attempt to Moshe's life and his subsequent flight to Mid Midian. And four, rescue the daughters and the priests of Midian. Moshe kills the Egyptian who strikes the Hebrew. This is part one. The Exodus 2.10. And the child grew, Vayegdal, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And he became her son. So she called his name Moshe, saying, because I drew him out of the water. Now it came to pass in those days... Bayamim ha hamim, that Moshe was grown, vayagadol, and he went out, vayatsa, and his brethren Ak, and saw Raha, their hard labor, and he saw Raha, an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of the brethren, Ak, so he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, there are plays here going on, because they're mentioned more than multiple times. So let's discuss these. These two verses, the Torah uses the same Hebrew phrase, and he grew twice. In 2.10, it describes the age when Moshe was weaned, which is after six years old. So basically, he would have been taught by his mother, his ancestral ways with Hashem, his God, Yah. But it's mentioning twice, and I told you before that when the scriptures repeat themselves and vary differently, they're trying to hint at something's going on. In the English, it doesn't play out as well, but in the Hebrew, it does because you can look at the words and then under, uh, try to get what the viewpoint of the author is trying to say. And to Levin, it points to Moshe being elevated to a position of authority in Pharaoh's house. The repeat of this verb in these two verses is meant to draw your attention to two different types of growth. Twice in verse 2.11, Moshe refers to the Israelite as his brethren, Ak. When I say Akim, that, you, that is my brother. Ak is brother. Akot is sister. Akotim is, you're my sister. The identification becomes part of his growth process. Moshe grew up in Pharaoh's house as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In that house, the Egyptians were his brethren. Now instead, his actions will be dictated by the deep identification with his Israelite brethren. He's making a distinction. There is a third set of double verbs. Moshe sees Ra'a, their suffering, and sees Ra'a, an Egyptian being a Hebrew. The second C means he merely perceived the one's eyes. 
The first C, however, means that he saw in their suffering. This is made clear by the grammatical form of the Hebrew, which is I put here. If the suffering was the direction of was the direct object of his seeing, it would have been expressed such as this. You can see the difference. Rashi explains that the Torah is expressed that Moshe is not the only identification with, but perceived with his heart as well. He becomes one with the suffering slave. In those days, Ba'amin Ha'ame, and he went out, Ya'atza, and others, interesting phrase found in verse 11. In those days, obviously, these are the days in which Moshe went out to his real brethren, to those to whom he discovers his brotherhood. Those are the days in which his heart begins to be in sync with his brethren. This national identification is what causes Moshe to react to the incident at hand. Moshe addresses the two fighting Hebrews later in Exodus 2.13, and when he went out, Vayatz again, the second day, behold, he drew, he, two Hebrew men were fighting, and he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking our companion, Raya? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill us as you killed the Egyptian? So Moshe feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now I want to go back up a little bit. We also talked in Ephesians 2 about how family acts. You can see this video. Um, the point is that family, when they interact, are to look at each other in a different light. Family is about safety and to bring down the walls that you have to battle with the world that you're in. But with family, you can let your guard down, or you should. It's a safety zone or area where you can be free from the bitterness of the world. So your attitude is usually of one of, oh, well, they're correcting me only to make me better. That's the visualization. But when you don't think of a person as your brother, you take offense and you become self, um, self-indulgent. Because family is about sacrificing. When you could become to God, you are sacrificing your desire for his will in your life. If you're not, then he isn't Lord in your life. You're just fooling yourself or you're playing. True faith is a willingness to give up the direction that you choose for the person that you're choosing for. Like in marriage, is the same way. You're giving up your dreams maybe sometimes. You're giving up a lot of things maybe sometimes. It doesn't matter, but the point is, is you're giving up in order for succession of something greater. And that's what's going on. They are giving up. But this person isn't. This person took offense to the accusation. Like, who are you to judge me? Is, is is what you're looking at here. Okay? But he is a prince of Egypt, and he's a judge, and if he really wanted to judge the individual just for his own edification, he could have called a court and had held a hearing. Because he is that individual. But he's judging to make the family better. When Jesus says that if you have a fence in Matthew 5, right? You go and make peace with that person. That's what the same thing is going on here. He's trying to bring peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Right? So, but this this fellow Hebrew who even has the blood of Hebrew pumping through him, he's not really a fellow brother because he took it offensively. He didn't look at Moshe as trying to help them to make peace with them and make proper family. He took it as an offense. Basically, he was self-centered and only thinking of himself. And at that, he said, what are you doing to do? To kill me like the Egyptian? He used a double barrel question, basically, back at him to hurt him. And that's what people do when they're, when they're wounded. They hurt. But the problem is, is the heart. Because the heart takes offense to this, meaning that it struck a chord. Somewhere Moses was correct at what he was saying, and he realized it. So Moses found, found out that everybody found out. 
And of course, my th his thinking is not the because in Egyptian, if you kill if he killed a Hebrew, and they would probably wouldn't have even prosecuted him. But the fact that he turned his back on supposedly his fellow brethren, he was found out that he's not um, thinking as an Egyptian. He's thinking and equating himself as a Hebrew. And this would have been very offensive. And this would have been a scandal. And this would have been destructive. So he gets out of town. We already know that the going out, vayats, or, sorry, vayatsa, means that Moshe is leaving the Egyptian household. But where he still lives is become one of his brethren. Imagine how disappointed and idealistic Moshe must feel as he now watches two Hebrews fighting amongst themselves. This day, Moshe reacts quite differently. He asks, why are you striking your companion? Raya, notice he does not refer to him as a brother. Yesterday, Moshe reacted spontaneously to his feelings of identification. The second day he rebukes comes from a certain amount of distancing. The one being addressed by Moshe is not happy because he accused Moshe of being a judge. People don't always like being judged by Mo Moses or by Moshe. And since they always say the Torah is Moshe, people don't like being judged by scripture. Because they like who they are. <laughs> they don't want to change. And that's the attitude that we all wrestle with and are, are wrestling with because God loves us for, and brings us and takes us for who we are, but he's not going to leave us where that. He wants us to identify as his. He wants attributes that he possesses to be our attributes. He destines us to change. The Spirit drives us there. The Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, will push us in that direction. John 5, 3, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. In other words, you're not willing to come and subjugate to you to me. You look at the scripture. You know that there is life in there. But you don't willingly subject yourself to me. Instead, you'll just quote them and you'll be... You'll play the game. But you know what? In reality, when you stand before him, you won't be able to fool him. There are 87% of pastors out there don't believe that there is a God. It's a job to them. Do not think that I shall accuse you, the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moshe, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moshe, you will believe me. For he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Believing the word is embracing them and walking in them. Because faith comes by hearing the word and doing the word of God. It goes back to the sh um, Shema. Hear and do. That's why it's important every time in the scripture it says hear to pay attention because the word Shema means to hear and do a general goes Shema people stand at attention they wait for the instruction they receive it and they act upon it same principle the second day Moshe was grown beyond his blind patriotism in Exodus 2:13, he can address the one who was wrong rather than just embrace him because he is Hebrew brother his eyes had been opened to the injustice of, the, of Egypt, had decided to help his brethren. But this second day, he became aware of something else. Amongst his children, amongst the children of Israel, there is also injustice. The man involved in the wrongdoing would prefer to continue in his set ways. He has no interest in having someone come and try to change him or his habits. To justify his actions, he even challenges Moshe's patriotism. Are you going to treat me, your brother, as you treated an Egyptian, a stranger to you? This is definitely how a lot of Christians hurt and are hypocrites. If you're not changing and you're just using Christianity as a blanket, you are a hypocrite. Because you're not doing what the scripture tells you that you're supposed to do. 
you are not being changed or conformed to the image of Messiah, Yeshua or Jesus, however you say it. The point is, you come as you are, but you're never going to be staying the same. It requires change. Exodus 2.14 tells us that Moshe feared because surely this is matter is known. What is that is it that is now out in the open? It is the mere fact that he killed an Egyptian. Or is it Moshe's change of attitude that he no longer identifies himself as an Egyptian, but has joined the heart and soul with Israelite? This would have him, make him a rebel in the kingdom, and Pharaoh would fear that he could end up leading a rebellion against him. Moshe had come out of the closet, so to speak. There is a price to pay when you divulge your Hebrew identity. When you cross over the def def definition of Hebrew, you see yourself as an Israelite. At the moment that you asked Messiah into your heart, and you said and chose to walk in the path of the Messiah, you're making a commitment, a covenant. You are entering into a covenant between God. He expects that you uphold that covenant. And how do you uphold that covenant? By reading the word of God, because it explains itself to you. That's the whole point. You don't have to guess. It's all there. Everything that has to do with Israel is to you, the convert. You are leaving paganism, which is Gentile, and you are converting to God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And just like them, you had to leave your home and go into a – and there's a promise of a promised land, even though you may not see it in your lifetime. The point is, you believe that that promise and that covenant. You believe that this God keeps his word, and you believe that he knows what he's doing. That is the whole point of that faith, the exercise of trusting what he says and that he will do. Think about it. When the covenant of the peace is between Abraham, when and you can go back and, re, and watch the video, I talked about that God put Abraham asleep and he walked through it himself. He took the penalty of us not living up to the expectation. He did not put it he, – if he would walked with, with um, Abraham and they entered into the custom and agreement, then the humans who transgressed it would be liable to death. And there's no, there would be no saving them. But because he took the penalty himself, then their, their actions, their wrongness, he gets to decide what happens to them. It's his to do because that brought that divide together. The gap that was – because at the rebellion, it was a rebellion. We turned away from God and our lot was death. And the Lord of Death was the enemy, the adversary, Satan. It's not, it's not, a, not a noun. It's a verb. It's an action. It's an adversary. His real name is Baal or Beelzebub or whatever. That, that doesn't really matter what his real name is. The point is our adversary became the king of us through death. But we were rescued from that. And God now gets to decide what happens to a person. Once they reach death, they don't go to the person who caused rebellion. And he became the God of the dead. Point three, Pharaoh's attempt to Moshe's life and his subsequent flight to Midian. Exodus 2.15, when Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moshe. But Moshe fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. We always come back to a well. Remember, Torah is well. It's depth. It's coolness and refreshing. The heart and soul dwells. The water of life. Because the word of God is life in us. And it, in, it helps us and encourages us. And it wants us to grow. When Moshe fled Egypt, did he leave with a sense that there was no possibility of changing the situation of his brethren? Did he believe there was no hope of saving Israel if the people were themselves had no intention of correcting the injustices among them? Moshe had a desire to help them out of the physical state of servitude to Pharaoh, but felt helpless that they were not willing to change their moral situation. And now that he was cut off from Egypt's root, Egyptian roots, 
he finds that he's not welcomed in his Hebrew brethren either. He is literally a stranger. As a side note of this re recurring cycle, there are early believers who kept Torah. Torah is synoptic with Moses. Were soon rejected by both the unbelieving Jews and by the church. Remember what I said. The church is Israel and er Israel is the church. But the, the, uh, the, 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 what I'm making a fact here is that by both Jews and on the church side, we still have rejection by both our brethren. Um, in the church, you see it every day, everywhere. There's enmity. Yeshua said that you will, they will know you by the love that you have for each other. But instead, there's a lot of hypocrites who claim that they're Christians, but yet their intent is to harm and destroy other people, which is something God hates and detests. And you read this in Matthew 5. He hates this attitude and he doesn't like it. And it is not of him. Therefore, they're worldly, and they're not saved at all. But I can't say who is saved and who isn't saved, but by acting the way you're acting, I don't think you have the Spirit in you. And the Spirit is the one that's going to drive you to eternal life. But it still is not my place to say who is and who isn't going to live or make it. But my point is, you don't have the Spirit of God in you. Same is with those of the Hebrew or the Jewish Judaism and Christianity, the two people who are united in one one stay, but both see each other as different. When actuality, if they merged together, would be very powerful that the enemy would hate. Soon strayed from the commandments of Elohim, perhaps even you have felt rejected by your former church family as they hate you for pursuing to Torah or Moses. Pursuing scripture, when you actually start acting on scripture and putting scripture first in your life, people hate you. Your own family will hate you, but also your church family will hate you, which tells you where their heart is. And you need to find a group of people who believe what you believe. And it is a fact that most Jews who are not happy about the remnant of non-Jewish believers who are beginning to align their lives with the Torah truth, but I would like to add, however, that that is an attitude that we are beginning to see a big change in. And there are a lot of things happening in Israel that are changing that. There are many Jews who are recognizing their brethren and welcoming them into the house of Israel. It is exactly as the remnant which the evil one is seeking to harm during the tribulation. Revelation 12:17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went, to make more with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. There is a balance here. Keeping the commandments is not enough, but the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. It creates a balance. Why do we follow the commandments? Because we were saved. We understand that the, his burden is, to us is light, but it's still a burden. But it's a light burden. These rules aren't to destroy us or hurt us. These life, these these rules give us life. They cement on how we interact with each other and how we are to keep our lives with each other as well as with our God and our Creator. They are about community and how the community thrives together in love and unity. But it's also about fences to keep us from wandering and getting lost. It's about cementing rights of individuals that when they are accused that they are not accused wrongly therefore everything is designed to help the community to drive the community to fellowship and in love and unity it is not a bad burden but like every household the father makes rules because he loves this family those rules are set up the same way as the scriptural rules are to keep the family together in unity and in love. They are not bad. How can you love God and then say that his rules are a burden? How can you love God and say, I hate Israel? You can't do that. You're lying to yourself. Stop lying to yourself. Let's return to the parasha. Moshe fleeing from the face of Pharaoh and settling in Midian 
shows that he is attempting to complete cultural break. He is letting go of both his Egyptian identity with his brethren as well. Divine providence has kept him from joining with the Israelites just because he feels comfortable with their cultural ways. The Almighty has a plan for bringing this Egyptian back into his Hebrew family. First, Moshe must see himself as a stranger, settling in a strange land to which he has no connection at all. Let's continue to see how the Father orchestrates his plan. Number point four, rescue of the daughters of the uh, priest of Midian, or Midian Exodus 2.16. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and draw water. Now there are a lot of other believers like Job uh, and Raul, and they're not like Balaam who mixed his religion and faith with others. Uh, Job and Raul both were faithful to the God of the Bible, Scripture, to Yah, but they were not in the Egyptian, uh, or they were not, sorry, not the Egyptian, but they were not in Israel either, as descendants of it. But God saw them as the same, and the, he was a priest of him. They filled the trowels of water with their father's flock. Then the, shepherd came, the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moshe stood up, kum, and held, helped Yasha them and watered their flock. The verse describes a third reaction to an incident by Moshe. In first, Moshe reacted patriotically out of the identification with his brethren. Then in the second incident between the Hebrew and the Egyptian, he reacted as a judge in rebuke of the wrongdoer. The root of his action was justice. Is that not what God says? To walk with me in humility and have justice? That's what he expects. So he acted on this injustice because he could. In 217, Moshe had no identification with the seven daughters, nor does he verbally judge the shepherds that he drives away. As Moshe plays the messianic role, note that Yeshua also said that he did not come to initially to judge. He didn't at that time. He came to save, not to judge. John 12:47. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The second time he comes as judge. Okay, keep in mind Yeshua's words that he came to save the world. Let's take another look at Exodus 2.17. Notice that Moshe did not what he did for the daughters. He stood up, he helped them. The Hebrew word for stood up is kum. It's the word that means to rise up or to resurrect. And that should draw you some pause. Yes. The Hebrew word for help is yasha. Here it is. More commonly translated as saved, in fact, is the root for Yeshua, Jesus. That's right. His, his name means saved, to help. That's what he came to do. Moshe acts because he's developed a heart for the oppressed. Like Yeshua, Moshe helped salvation is first, and then he takes them to the water, symbol of Torah, to drink. So when he rescues you, and when you pledge your life to him, that's what you're doing when you say, come into my heart, okay? You are pledging yourself to him. You are making a covenant. Whether you acknowledge it or not is not the point. The fact is you are. John 3.16, For Yah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 14.15, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's how God determines your expression of love. Not that you love him and you love him you love him. It has to be an expression of love. The seven daughters were shepherdesses that were attempting to water their father's flock. They had filled the trowels with clean, clear water, but evil shepherds drove them away. The result was stirred up, muddied water for their flocks. Yah made it clear how he feels about shepherds who muddy the water for his flock in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, 18 
It is too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture, to to have drunk of the clear waters, that you must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet, and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore thus says Adonai, Yah, to them behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed the sides and the shoulders, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between the sheep and sheep. First of all, these pastors, or these leaders, or lay leaders, whatever, they're sheep as well. And they have they have gleaned from uh, others and stolen from others and taken from others for themselves, their selfishness. And he's saying, I'm going to judge you. I will make you bear and I will expose you to all of the people of God. And there is nowhere that you can hide. And I will judge you rightly. I look forward to that day, honestly. When all those who are pra who are not practicing correctly, who knowingly are going disobediently and knowingly doing what they do, only to make themselves uh, better. When you enter the kingdom as a leader, you're a servant of the servants. You're not there to gain rich riches of this world and according to the riches of the world. You're there only for what is needed, which is a roof over your head, food in your stomach, and that's it. You're not to be a rich millionaire. You're not supposed to live luxurious. You are supposed to live like the rest of the sheep, the same as. But no, instead you take and you take and you take and you don't give. That's the problem that's going on. And there are many who are sheep that give and give out of earnestness because they that's their heart. And they're being taken advantage of. But God will expose that. And they will someday pay for what they have done. And honestly, I work, look forward to that because that's justice. There are several comparisons between the story of Moshe and the story of Jacob. Both men flee from someone who wants to kill them. Yes. Both sit at a well and meet shepherds there. Both meet their future wife at the well, which is funny. I like that. Both help out the women at the well. Jacob rolls the heavy rock off the mouth of the well, and Moses helps the women against the shepherds. Both water the flock. Both are invited to dwell in the father's house where only afterwards marriage is discussed. Shepherd the flocks that are representative of the father-in-law. Ask And both ask permission of his father-in-law and return to his land at the same time that Yah has revealed it to him. It is because of these many similarities that their differences are highlighted. When Jacob met Rachel, he was mentioned her by name in the story and he immediately knew he wanted to marry her. Consequently, he was forced to live with Laban. Their relationship was not good. But the name of Moses' future wife is not mentioned at the well. And the story seems to emphasize the relationship between Moshe and his father. Moshe comes into the home of seven daughters because Raoul invites him. The text does not indicate that it is for the purpose of marrying one of his daughters. The, a relationship is instead established between the men. So he said to the daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that we may eat bread. Then Moshe was content to live with the man. He gave Sipporah, his daughter, to Moshe. It's the difference between the two of, of what Jacob was going through and what Moses was going through. And those differences, when you see similarities like that, are to highlight certain things going on. The priest of God it has the attributes of God. And he was like, oh, why didn't you invite him in? Hospitality, bring the, bring the guy in. He has shown favor to us. Just as as God says to when people show favor, they're part of our household. In the hopes that a greater and deeper relationship will continue. Who is Raul? Also known as Jethro or Yethro. 
and what causes Moshe to become so drawn to him. Rashi writes, and Rashi was around the time that the Moors were being kicked out of Spain, or actually were taking over Spain before it became Spain. Um, they were being conquered, and life for the Jews was disrupted. So he moved to Egypt, where he became a, a great commentator that people call Mo, him Moshe II. Um, so it's interesting. He writes, And the priests of Medin were separated himself from idolatry, and they, his own country, banished him from their midst. Ibn, Ibn Ezra, the son of Ezra, writes, Every priest referred to in the Tanakh serves either Hashem or idols, and Yithro, Jethro was a priest of Hashem. According to these comment commentators, Yethro was not a priest of idolatrous worship, but rather a servant of Yah. This is also ident is indicated by the meaning of his two names in Shemot, Raul, which means friend of El, El is God, and Yethro, which means his rem remnant. The sages painted Yethro as a spiritual figure who was cut off from others out of the feeling that there is no possibility of influence because people influencing people to change their ways because the things they have in common the close relationship that Moshe will establish with Yethro is quite understandable as a result of living with Yethro Moshe is given Zipporah as a wife unlike the wives of the patriarchs we are told nothing of her character or actions before the marriage apparently the Torah's point is that the connection between Yethro and Moshe is primarily their relationship and the marriage is merely an extension of that. And we're going to talk more about that later because um, he's a mentor to him. And when they return from Egypt, um, there's a, a story going on that we need to talk about. Moshe grows close to Yethro. Therefore, he marries his daughter. As we continue our comparison to Moshe and Yeshua, we can see that Yeshua has been in the midst of the people of this world. He too has taken a wife from there. Are you not the bride? So as you can see, you are part of Moshe, okay, Moses, and Yeshua, who are the identical, and that you are the bride. The son is born to Moshe and his wife. Exodus 2.22, and she bore him a son, and he called his name Gershon. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. The naming of Moshe's first son gives us a brief glimpse into his thoughts at that point. He names him Gershon, which means foreigner. Immediately after the naming, the Torah takes us back to the story of Israelites. Is there a connection that is between Moshe's naming of Gershon and Elohim's decision to remember his covenant of his people? It's not that God forgets. It's about remembering, and we're going to talk about that. Exodus 2.23 Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came to Elohim because of the bondage. So Elohim heard their groaning, and Elohim remembered Zachar, his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And Elohim took upon the children of Israel, and Elohim knew them. There's a story here. I hope you're seeing it. First, let's remember the definition of remember, zakar. The fact that Elohim remembers does not mean that he ever truly forgot. I like what Brad Scott says, and Brad Scott is a really good author. He has a lot of on his website as well as books, and I recommend you, you as a Christian read them. They will help you on that road of discovery, more depth in the scriptures. I like Brad Scott's definition of zakar, which is to act on behalf of. So in Shemot 2.24, Elohim is going to once again act on behalf of the covenant and the children of Israel because he knows them. It's an intimacy language. It's a partnership language, much like marriage, the bride, the son. The father is Yethro, and he has the attributes of the father in heaven. And Moshe is acting like the Messiah, the Savior, and the children of Israel are the bride. They're going to come for the bride. Act on their behalf. 
to find the connection between the naming of Moshe's son and Elohim's and remembrance of the covenant, we shall return to Bereshit, Genesis, and announce the announcement made during the cutting of that covenant. Genesis 15:13. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers, Gerim, in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved, Avdum, and they will be they will afflict in new them for hundred years. That's prophecy. You're seeing it on you're seeing it fulfilled. To fulfill the term of the covenant, the sons of Israel will have to endure three conditions. Two of these conditions have already been mentioned mercilessly in Shemot. To be enslaved, to be afflicted, and to be strangers. What about the third condition? Did the Israelites in Egypt see themselves as strangers and soldiers in a foreign land? Entirely we saw a connection between Moshe and Jacob. It is interesting that Jacob's exile, he also underwent affliction and enslavement. In fact, the word for slavery, Adim, appears uh, 14 times in Jacob's story. Notice also how Jacob describes his status in Laban's household, Bereshit 32-4, and he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob has, says, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. These are the connections. These are the dots that you need to understand so that you can understand where you are in your life. Apparently one must recognize that they are a stranger before the Almighty begins to remember to act on their behalf for them. With this understanding, let's return to the naming of Moshe son. He named him Gershom, a foreigner, stranger. For he said, I am a stranger in a foreign land. By naming him Gershom, Moshe was more than just acknowledging that he was estranged from his homeland. He saw the missing element requiring to be a stranger according to the covenant of Bereshit 1513. For the redemption of the children of Israel to begin with the understanding the Father will now be able to use the mightily, the book of Acts also notes that Moshe was indeed a stranger. Acts 7.29 Then at the saying, Moshe fled and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. Isn't it beautiful how scripture connects? And you can see how this, everything is interwoven together to teach us about where we are and how we are in life and also what is needed. The Israelites had made themselves a home in Egypt. They all had, they had assimilated into the culture in many ways. This is where assimilation is not good. We are not called to assimilate to this world. We are called to be in this world but not of it. Assimilating means that you surrender to the culture. And there is an evil being that is a cultural deity their ways are not our ways our ways are what scripture teaches us it is not mentioned that they yet threw themselves as strangers unfortunately they had not had to go through trials and tribulations and tribulations were designed for the believer to put to the press basically god wants to see do you really love me if you really love me I'm going to see the reaction to it because you either fall away or you will persevere and keep going no matter what the cost. That is what uh, tribulation is for. To come to the understanding, do you think of yourself as a stranger? Will it take the coming tribulation to remind us that this world is not our home? David writes in the Psalms how he feels about this earth. Psalm 119, 19, I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. Because the commandments give us life in our hearts. They fill us with the love and understanding of our Father and how we are to act toward each other. And they give us life because of those actions and the attributes of the Father that we do. Because we are acting out who the Father is. And that's a witness and a testimony to this world. 
that no one can deny. In fact, you will be paraded between the beings in the heavens, showing the attributes that you have done and that you were loyal to him. And that is your testimony of your life and why you go through the agony that you do is so that you can demonstrate that no matter what, you were determined because you saw the you saw the value in the Father. When speaking to those receiving an inheritance, Yeshua describes himself as a stranger who was served by the righteous. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those who his right hand come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. Notice the stranger. And you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. And I was in prison and you came to me. And when the righteous will answer him saying, Adonai, when did we see the hungry and feed you? For thirst and give you drink. When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Okay. Inasmuch as you did to the least of my brethren, the association, so these are people who are not of a family. They're strangers, but they're acting righteous. They're demonstrating the attributes of the Father. And they are counted as such. They are given rewards for their actions. We can't tell even people who are wicked naturally, but yet do demonstrations. The Father will reward them for their good deeds. It's not for our position to judge people for their good deeds that they should not share. When Yeshua was talking about the the coin, the denarii, and he paid the people who came early in the morning and then he went out and got more people and went halfway through and then he got people for one hour and he paid everyone the same. That is like eternal life or, or maybe it's just life in general. And he says to them, and the, uh, well, but we've been here all day. And he says, it's for me to give. If I want to give, it's for me. So to sit yourself in God's throne and to judge in that fashion, I think is a high crime. Because you're going to have to answer to the one who actually sits in that throne. So people who do these things, who do good deeds, it's interesting, and we're going to talk about this later because there is several passages that I would like to highlight later, but not right now. The book of Hebrews notes that all the patriarchs threw themselves at, thought of themselves as strangers and looked forward to the heavenly city. Hebrews 11:13. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind what country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country where Adonai is not ashamed to be called their Adonai, for he has prepared a city for them. Shemot, Shemot 3, 10, 1. Now Moshe was tending the flock of Yethro, his father-in-law, and the priest of Midan, of Mid, Mid, excuse me, of Midan, and he led the flock back to the desert and came to Horeb. And the mountain of Elohim and the angel of Yah appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moshe said, I will not turn aside to see the great sight. Why the bush does not burn? So when Yah saw, he turned aside and looked. Elohim called to him and said in the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And remember, holiness means set apart, different. Don't use dead skins of sandals. Put your feet, which I created, in this ground. Moreover, he said, I am Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, the Elohim of Jacob, 
and Moshe hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon Elohim. Here's a picture of it. I think it gives good representation. The imagery of the consuming fire is one that is commonly seen throughout scriptures to describe the manifestation of Yah's presence. Soon we will read that in Exodus, the Almighty will lead his people nightly through journeys by the pillar of fire and by day cloud. So, this ends our position uh, of the Torah portion for Shemot, and I hope that it was encouragement to you, and I pray that you have a blessed week, um, that you'll meditate. Meditating on scripture is like a cow who has many stomachs. It goes in one stomach and comes back up and regurgitates. It's your thinking and dwelling upon it throughout the week until it is finally digested totally. So please, please meditate upon this throughout the week. Think about it. I hope that it encourages you and it strengthens you in your walk and in your faith. Because faith, remember, comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hearing and doing the word of God is important to understand. And I pray that the Ruach, the Spirit, uh, convicts you and to walk, continue to walk and encourages you to grow in this way. May you be blessed. And may the Lord be with you, and make his and I hope that his face shines upon you, and he gives you shalom. Thank you for your time, and I wish you the best of week.